Hello, this is Matt from Matt Heaney Apps and welcome to the seventh and final part in a series teaching you how to make the full iPhone game solo mission in Xcode using SpriteKit and Swift. So we are now very close to having a full finished game and all that is left to do today is our main menu and our backing audio. And once they are done, so by the end of this video, you would have made a full game in Xcode using SpriteKit and Swift. So by the end of this video, your finished game will look like this. So let's jump back into Xcode to finish this project. The game itself is now completely finished, but at the moment when you open the game, you're taken straight into the game scene. So when you tap on the game icon on your phone or iPad or whatever, you're taken straight into the game. So we will make a main menu, which will show the game's name, show who made the game, and give the player a chance to move into the game. So that's what we will do now. We will set up our main menu. So for this, we need a brand new scene. File, new file. Gonna be iOS source, Swift file and we will call this main menu scene and hit create. Over on the left, you will now see a main menu scene.swift that will look like this. Just like when we made our game over scene, this is just a completely blank file, it doesn't do anything. So before we can do anything, we have to set this file up as a scene. So we will import sprite kit and then we will say class main menu scene. It's gonna be an SK scene, open curly bracket, drop some lines. So we now have a main menu scene. In this scene, we will make our main menu. So in this scene, we want a did move to view. So code will run as soon as we move into this scene. And here we will create what our main menu will look like. So we want our main menu to look like this. It will have a background. It will say solo mission. There will be a start button and there'll be some credits on there. So mine says Matt Heaney's solo mission. As this is just a sprite node and a whole bunch of labels, which we've done a lot of in this project, especially in the game over scene. And as there's no benefit of me going through all of these labels again, it won't be fun to watch and you won't really learn anything from me going over it again. I will do them all off camera. I'll show you which sprite nodes and which labels I have made so you can make yours exactly the same. So I'll see you in a few seconds. Okay, so here is our main menu. In the did move to view, I created a sprite node for our background, which uses the image of background. It's positioned in the center of the screen, has a Z position of zero and added the background. We have a label for the credits, uses the font, the bold font has text, mine says Matt Heaney's. Font size of 50 with white font, positioned halfway across the scene, 78% of the way up. Obviously play around with these percentages if you want to change how this looks. Z position of one and added the label. Two labels to show our game name. So game name one says solo, font size 200, white font, 70% of the way up the scene, halfway across. Z position of one, added the first label. Game name two says mission, so works with the top label. Font size 200, font color of white, positioned halfway across the scene, 62.5% of the way up. So it sits nicely under the other label. Z position of one and added this label. And finally, a label that says start game. This will work as a button, has a font size of 150, white font, positioned halfway across the scene, 40% going up. Z position of one and added the start game label. So this here has made up our main menu. We have a background, we have three labels to show the game name and who made the game and a label that's gonna work as a button. So before we make our button work, let's check this out to make sure it's looking exactly as we want it to look. So if we just hit run now, even though we have a main menu, we'll still be taken straight into our game scene. Okay, so the code doesn't know that this is a main menu. It doesn't know that this is the scene we want straight away. We know it's a main menu, but we have to tell our code that this is the scene that we want to move to first. And to do that, we will jump into our game view controller, the view that is presenting all of our scenes, and find the line that we set up way back in part one. And as you can see, we're saying straight away, move into the game scene. So we're gonna change this to say, move us into the main menu scene. So now when we open our game, this will run. 
and this is dealing with presenting our scene and now it knows to go straight to the main menu scene rather than straight into our game scene. So let's hit run and let's check out our main menu. So now when we open up our game, we're taken straight into our main menu. At the moment, we can't really do anything. What we want to happen from here is when you tap on the start game button, it will take you into the game scene. So let's jump back into Xcode and we'll make this label into a button. Okay, so back into our main menu scene and we'll turn our start game label into a button. What we will do, we'll do this in a slightly different way to what we did in the game over scene. Because as you may remember, in the game over scene, we made our label global and then directly compared where we were touching on the screen and the position of that label. So that's one way of doing it. Another way is what we would do now. So the main menu scene, and it starts off very similar. So we still have to find out where we touched on the screen. So touches began, the function that will run when we touch the screen. And we still have to figure out where we touched on the screen. So for touch, any object in touches, so breaking down touches, what would be in passed in this function. And to get to where we touched on the screen, we will say let point of touch is going to equal touch. So this from here, dot location in node of self. So where do we touch in the scene? Now, instead of directly saying, did we touch the start game label? What we're going to do, we will figure out if we touched any node. We will then use that to make sure we have pushed the correct node. And if we have pushed the correct node, so the correct object, which in this case is the start game label, then do something, which in this case is move into the game scene. So what I would do is say let node I tapped equals node point of point of touch. So now if we touch any object, that object will now be stored as node I tapped. So figure out where we're touching on the screen. And if that point is on any object, take that object and set it to node I tapped. So what we could do now is say node I tapped. And we could, for example, run an action on that node. We're not going to, but we could do. Okay, so any object that we touch will now be set to node I tapped. So we could affect that object or do whatever we want to it. But we don't really want to affect it. We just want to know which node it actually is. So we have to find a way to figure out which object this is. So to do that, what we're going to do, when we set up our start game label, we're going to give it a name, something like start button. Okay, so our start game label now has that reference name. So what we can now do is say if node I tapped, so the node that we touched, if that has a name of start button, then do the following. You might have to put your closing curly bracket in there. You normally put it in for you, didn't seem to put mine in for me. So now, what we're saying is figure out where we touched on the screen, figure out what node we pushed, and if that node has a name of start button, then do the following. So this would mean that the node that we pushed is our start game label, okay? So just another way of making your objects into buttons. So now any code between here is going to run if we push on our label with the name start button. So what do we want to happen? Well, we want to move into our game scene. So let scene to move to, it's gonna be our game scene, and we'll pass it the size the same as this scene. Scene to move to, same with the scale mode. This is the exact same as when we moved between our other scenes. We will have a transition. It's going to be fade with duration across 0.5 seconds. It's good to keep it consistent throughout your entire game, unless there's a reason to make it different. And then we will take the view and we will present this scene. So scene to move to, which is our game scene with the size and the scale mode that we set using our transition. And there we go. We've now turned that label into a button by using the reference name. And we have said if the object that we have pushed is that label, then take us into the game scene. Okay, so now if we push on our label, we'll get taken into the game scene to start the game. And just with that, our main menu is now set up and ready to go. So let's check it out. Okay, so here is our main menu. We can tap start game and we are taken into the game where we can start playing like normal. So our game is now very close to being done and you could quite easily class this as a finished working game. This is one more thing that I want to throw into this game which makes any game like this a million times better. And that is backing audio. Okay, so let's throw in some backing audio. It is completely different to sound effects and I'll tell you why. And that will finish off our entire game. So let's jump back into Xcode to finish this project. 
Okay, so back into Xcode, and we will now finish up with our backing audio. So for the backing audio, we will do this in a way that is completely different to our sound effects. Because as you may remember, in our game scene, we declared a couple of global actions to play some sound effects. The problem with this is, it's very, very limited. It's more than fine for sound effects, but all you can do is really play the sound effect. And that's sort of it, which for a quick sound effect, is fine. But for backing audio, you want to have as much control as possible because it plays such a big part in your game. So we will set this up using AV Foundation and using an AV Audio Player. So what we're gonna do, instead of setting this up in a scene, we are going to jump over into our game view controller and do it here. And the reason for that is this view controller in our game is always there because this is what's presenting the scenes. Even though we're changing scene in our game, we're just changing the scene that this view controller presents. So the entire time, the game view controller is actually on the screen behind the scenes. So if we make our audio play here, it would then play throughout our entire game. So we will do it here. The first thing we have to do is import AV Foundation. This will let us use all of the code to make our audio work. With that, we can now declare, we will declare a variable which we will call back in audio. And this will be an AV audio player. So back in audio, the AV audio player is going to be what is playing our audio. And through back in audio, we can have all of the control over our back in audio. Okay, so all we have to do is tell back in audio which sound file we want to play. We will set it up and we can play it. So before we can tell back in audio which audio track we want to play, we actually have to have a back in audio track. So find a back in audio track and drag it into Xcode. Mine is here on my desktop. As with all sounds, I can't give you this back in audio because I paid for a license to use it in this video. There'll be a link down in the video description with the full credits for this audio and a link if you want to get your hands on this audio. If not, just use your own backing audio. So we'll drag this into Xcode. We'll make sure copy items if needed is ticked and hit finish. And we now have backinaudio.mp3 in our project. Okay, so let's make this play. What we'll do is jump into our view did load which is the code that's gonna run as soon as this view controller loads up. And here, we will say that we want back in audio, our AV audio player, to play our audio, and then we will simply start it. Now, even though all of the code will be in this one function, we've made this global in the view controller. I always found when you declare it in the view did load, sometimes it just randomly stops. If you do it globally, that's never a problem, okay? so. All we have to do in here is tell our AV audio player which track we want to play and then make it play. Now, this is not as straightforward as saying play this sound file. What we have to do, we have to find the file path for the file and then get an NSURL for the file and then make the backing audio play through the NSURL, okay? So all we're doing is saying which file we want to play. So what we're gonna do is say let file path is going to equal an ns bundle dot main bundle dot path for resource so here we will say which audio track we want to play okay so mine is called back in audio dot mp3 so here i will say backing audio and then in of type we will put the mp3 so put the file format here rather than here so that's our path. To get the NSURL, which the AV audio player needs to know which track to play, we are going to say let audio NSURL is going to equal an NSURL file URL with path, at which point we're going to pass down the file path from up here. So file path, and we have to force unwrap that. So we said which track we want to play. We found the file path. And from that, we found our audio file URL. What we then have to do is tell our AV audio player to play the track found at this file URL. But to do that, what we have to do is use a do catch statement, which is something that Apple enforces to do this for error checking. So if something goes wrong, we can print a message or do something to tell us what's gone wrong. So what we're gonna do is say do, 
what we'll do is type it in and I'll explain to you what it's doing. I'm going to say do, and then we're going to take back in audio, our AV audio player, and now we can set this up by saying try AV audio player, and it will play the contents of the URL of audio NS URL. Audio NS URL from up there, with closing curly bracket at the end. Drop a line, we're going to say catch, open curly bracket. At this point, we will return print statement that says cannot find the audio with a closing curly bracket at the end. So all this is doing is saying try to do this. If you can, do it. If you can't and something's gone wrong, do this. So if you can do it, do it. If you can't and you catch an error, do this. Okay, so try to set back in audio to our NS URL, which is pretty much telling it which track we want to play. And if it can, then great, do it. If it can't, tell us that you can't find the audio. Okay, it'll crash out and tell us this here. Which is good in a way, because if we made a typo up here, if we had like back in to audio or use a lowercase b or whatever, or we say, for example, we put the wrong file format, it's gonna tell us that you can't find the audio. This way it points you in the right direction. It will tell you it can't find the audio. So it will help you try to fix why it's not working. Okay, so all of that is just telling our audio player which track we want to play. We've said find the file path for the track that we want to play, grab the URL. If you can find this URL successfully, prep our back in audio audio player, and if you can't, tell us why. Then all we gotta do is take back in audio and set it up, and now this is where that complete control comes in. So we want this to loop forever. So I'm gonna say number of loops, and if we wanted this to play just once, we'd say one. If we wanted to play twice, we'd say two. If we wanted to play forever, we can say minus one. So now back in audio, will loop forever. So when the audio ends, it will start again. Now the cool thing about AV Foundation and audio players is the amount of control. We can set the volume with one being normal, zero being you can't hear it. We can set how fast the audio goes. You have complete control. So all we have to do is take back in audio and tell it to play. And that's it. We declared an AV audio player after importing our AV foundation so we can actually use all this code. We told it which file we wanted to play. We said loop forever and play. And this is happening in our game view controller. So it happened behind the scenes so it played for the entire game. So that right there is our back in audio now working. Now set up so it plays on every scene. And that is pretty much the end of our game. And it's just one very, very, very small thing left to do that you do at the end of all your game development projects. And we will find the show FPS and the show node count, which is a little label in the bottom right hand corner of your game, which tells you how many frames per second you're running at and how many nodes. They are just development tools. So we will now set those to false. And with that, our game is now done. We now have back in audio and we turned off the development tools to finish the project. So hit run and let's check out our finished game. So now here is our finished game. As you can hear, we have back in audio and the two little labels in the bottom right hand corner, which showed our frames per second and how many objects we had on the screen are now gone. So if we hit start game, we can jump into the game, the back in audio is still playing. We can take out some enemies. You'd think after playing this game for so long, making this series, I'd be good at it by now. Apparently not. But the entire game is now working. That back in audio is going to continue to play. It will loop forever whilst we keep playing the game. Trying to take out as many enemies as possible. Trying to beat the highest score. And there we go. We are now all done with this entire project and we have now finished making this entire game. So congratulations, you have now made Solo Mission. And I guess that is all for this series. If you liked watching this video and this entire series, which I really hope you did, hit that like button, hit subscribe, comment about anything you fancy, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.